I, I want to start with um, uh, a quick quote. Um, the vice president yesterday of Ghana, um, Dr. Baumia, I'm, I'm, I, 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 Yoruba, and this is Ghana. I, I'm probably going to mispronounce that. I'm so sorry. Um, um, but yesterday, he eulogized W.E.B. Du Bois, and he stated, quote, for us in Ghana, we are grateful that W.E.B. Du Bois chose to spend his last days on earth with us, profoundly influencing the newly independent country and leader to be uh, uh, and leader to be assertive in the comity of nations. 55 years after his demise, we continue to draw inspiration from his works, for, re for which, I'm sorry, for which reason Ghana and Africa are eternally grateful to you. So our good friend Arthur McFarlane II, who is also a great grandson of W.E.B. Du Bois, is over there celebrating the 150th birthday with the folks in Ghana, and we are fortunate to have, I call them the Jeffs, but, but Jeff and Jeff, Jeff Peck and Jeff Peck here with us in, in Western Massachusetts to celebrate with us here. And they will be also with us in Great Barrington. Um, the powerful words that the Vice President of Ghana said, um, it should be something that is, is, it rings true in our country as well. And it, it doesn't seem to be that way. As, as young Jeff Peck said, to grow up in a school system, to not hear about his great-great-grandfather, but to not understand and to know many undergraduates that come to our university that either say Dubois or don't know who Du Bois is in relationship to Massachusetts, to um, social change, and to civil rights. I think that um, we are in a, in a very necessary moment, but a very exciting moment. We are at the moment in which civil rights is once again, or the rights of young people are once again being heard from Florida up the coast and, with, and, and, and throughout. So I want to bring that up because I want to talk about the words and the legacy of Du Bois are needed generation after generation after generation. And like I've said before, apparently it's been quoted a couple of times, he's a man of all times. He is a man whose initial work changed because he lived 95 years. And he was able to change his mind. Hear that, scholars? <laughs> and, and I also say this, as, as like I said, into being in this, in this space and feeling so wonderful of, of, of all the love and the, and the and excitement around this. I want you all to feel my excitement. I hope you can, can you? Okay, because I love what I do. But I mean, I'm also still riding high, you know, after my recent trip to Wakanda. So I feel, I feel really, really, <laughs> I went there. Raylan has done, a, I'm sorry, Dr. Rebecca has done a piece on it too, so I'm not just saying this out in a vacuum. Black Panther, uh, Wakanda forever. Um, and it came just in time for his birthday. It's just like, wow, wow. It's a prelude to, okay. <laughs> so that's why I want to say this is, this is a happy moment because I think that um, we are going to experience someone who, when I had to dream about who could speak for his 150th birthday for the 24th annual lecture, um, Dr. Rebecca was the first person that I thought of. He is a professor and chair of African and African American and Caribbean Studies in Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where it is seven degrees. <laughs> where he also has affiliations with the Women and Gender Studies Program, Humanities Program, Graduate Program in Cultural Theory, School of Education, College of Media, Communication and Information, and the College of Music, because he started out as a jazz musician, I just wanted to include that. He is the author of more than 50 scholarly articles and book chapters, as well as 12 books, which I'm not going to read all here, but um, among them are Du Bois' Dialectics, Africana Critical Theory, Against Epistem, Epimis, I'm sorry, Epistemic, thank you, thank you family, Epistemic Apartheid, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Disciplinary Decadence of Sociology, Forms of Fanonism, Franz Fanon's Critical Theory and the Dialectics of Decolonization, 
the negritude movement, hip hop's inheritance, hip hop's amnesia, and the hip hop movement. Um, Rebecca's research has been recognized with several awards, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Science Foundation, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Institution. He has received several book awards. He has conducted archival research and lectured extensively both nationally and internationally and has been the recipient of numerous community service citations, distinguished teaching awards, and research fellowships. Rabaka's cultural criticism, social commentary, and political analysis has been featured in print, radio, television, and online media venues such as NPR, PBS, BBC, CNN, ABC. I could go on. BET and VH1 had to include them. The Huffington Post, the Denver Post, the Dallas Morning News, etc. And I want to say that. When I first met Dr. Rabaka, it was five years ago when we were pulling together the amazing Du Bois in Our Time exhibit at the University Museum of Contemporary Art. And it brought together scholars and artists in conversation. And I don't think, I mean, we also had Sadia Hartman. We had, we had some, some serious folks in that room. But what I learned from, from Dr. Rabaka was the idea of activism and, and scholarship, all of those, they're not separate things. They don't have to be separate. To be an intellectual, it shouldn't be as, as narrowing as we tend to look at it th today. And I hope that you understand the importance and the significance of this space, this time, this moment, as civil rights is burgeoning and starting again, or maybe it's never gone away. That's right. So I'm going to introduce to you with a very, very warm UMass Du Bois Center loving community. Um, please welcome Dr. Raylan Rabaka to the stage. I'm in trouble. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very, very humbled by just the opening uh, I here. I, I feel like I can just go back to Boulder, you know, get back on my snowboard. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I, I want to say thank you so much to Dr. Whitney Battle Batiste. I, I can't say thank you enough. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the vote of confidence. Um, it means the world to me. And in fact, I'll say it in Kiswahili, <laughs> Santi Sana, Nashakuru Sana. You know, uh, thank you a thousand times for every grain of sand, of sand on the seashore. I say thank you. Um, I'd like to also thank Carol uh, uh, and Emily uh, and all the other folk in the Du Bois Center who made this happen. Uh, and I want to thank you, UMass. Thank you for, for showing up, for, for being here today. Um, I have family and friends in the audience. Uh, what's up, Chris? What's up, Dr. Shabazz? You know, so I want to shout out all my beautiful people. But since you brought me here, <laughs> Let's get right into it. Um, in the spirit of Du Bois, I want to just say as a disclaimer that um, I'm sort of uh, more interested in a dialogue with Du Bois today. Um, this isn't a scholarly conference, so people that will criticize me for not being highfalutin, that's not what this is about, right? This isn't a, a professional conference. So this is about exposing that next generation to Du Bois. I'm really, really uh, committed to sharing Du Bois with the next generation. Why? Because my first great teacher, Mrs. Robinson, during Black History Month in 1979, she did it with me. And I was so mad when she gave me a Frenchman. See, I thought he was a Frenchman. <laughs> everybody else, everybody else, somebody got Duke Ellington, somebody got Bessie Smith, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Marcus Garvey, and then she gave me a Frenchman. And so I strolled up to her desk and said, Mrs. Robinson, I think there has been a mistake. <laughs> and she said, Raylan, you know what? If you would read as much as you run your mouth. <laughs> and so, of course, I had to stay after class. My mother wasn't happy. And she walked me to the library, and she showed me Du Bois, and that was the first book. The Souls of Black Folk was the first book I've ever seen with a black person on the cover. And it changed me fundamentally. 
So yes, Wakanda forever. Yes. <laughs> Seeing images of us <laughs> is very powerful, and I think some people take that for granted. So anyways, another one of my disclaimers, since I have the Dean of Libraries right here before me, uh, I believe I have been coming here to UMass and attempting to work in the papers, very humbly, attempting to work in the papers since 1997, might have been 96. And so Du Bois brought me to Massachusetts. I had never been in Massachusetts before. This was the only reason I came here. And now this is like a second home to me. I, I quite love it out here, especially since the weather's nicer than in Boulder. But anyway, I'm going to leave that alone. So let's get right into it. Uh, the, the title today, W.E.B. Du Bois, Reflections on His Life and Legacy, 1868 uh, through 2018. About 150 years here. This talk is going to be one where I emphasize Du Bois' interdisciplinarity and his intersectionality. When we say interdisciplinarity, we're talking about, uh, literally, Du Bois working in between and contributing to many different disciplines. This is going to be fundamental to that field that we call African American studies, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. It's also fundamental to women and gender and sexuality studies. It's also fundamental to post-colonial and decolonial studies. And in fact, it's also fundamental to LGBTQ studies, interdisciplinarity, right, and the power of it. And in essence, I say that Du Bois is a classical interdisciplinarian. In fact, he's a proto interdisciplinarian. That means before, for, you know, all y'all. Anyway, I, I wasn't going to get high for Luton, but sometimes I can't help it. Okay, <laughs> Du Bois is also uh, embraces intersectionality, this whole notion of um, the, the critical exploration of the interconnected nature of identity and social categories such as race, gender, class, and sexuality. So Du Bois, again, would be a proto-intersectionalist. So this talk is really going to be couched operating from these two angles here. This is also how I have attempted to dialogue with Du Bois in the 21st century. Some people like to think of Du Bois as a very 20th century figure. And in fact, my first book is called Du Bois and the Problems of the 21st Century. What am I saying? I'm saying that Du Bois is still incredibly relevant for us today in the 21st century. In order to understand Du Bois, we need to understand the National Association of Colored Women. And in fact, it is this organization that took an orphan Du Bois in when his mother passed away on March 23rd, 1884. He was only 16 years old when his mother passed away. So we need to understand how is it that this 16-year-old, who's the only African-American in the town of Great Barrington, at least one of the only children there, how is it that he's able to complete high school, go to Fisk, Harvard, and the University of Berlin? We need to understand some things about this organization, an organization that's really going to be instrumental to understanding who Du Bois is. I also just want to shout out, Sister Whitney, that I am beginning on a black feminist note, which is where I almost always begin. Why? Because my grandmother was one of these, or is, she's 90 years old, she is one of these club's women uh, down in Texas. And my mother uh, is one of these club's women down in Texas. So the National Association of Colored Women, established in 1896 by Harriet Tubman. I'm going to say that again. By Harriet Tubman, the godmother of our people. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, and Margaret Murray Washington. You can see there, mm, I, I mean, I, all day long. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you, Trev. I needed that <laughs> call and response. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get a better show if you talk back to me. <laughs> Here we go. It's so beautiful. Here we go. National Association of Colored Women. Again, I want to foreground Harriet Tubman, who inspired someone by the name of Frederick Douglass. And in fact, if you go and get a book uh, by Frederick Douglass, it's called Frederick Douglass on Women's Rights. And he says that he got up the courage to challenge the enslavement because of Harriet Tubman's example. This is really powerful. Because a lot, of times, a lot of times when we talk about a lot of these great male figures, the sisters are always in the background instead of right alongside us. I think that that's important, and I know that's African American studies as well. Okay? So when we talk about the National Association of Colored Women, we're talking about the foremothers of contemporary black feminism slash womanism. They engaged in a wide range of issues, including civil rights, women's rights, voting rights, lynching, poverty, crime, and alcohol, uh, uh, critiquing alcoholism, health, 
and education. So again, you can really see the germ for what's later on going to become the civil rights movement. The seed of it is here. And in fact, if you go and engage the work of Darlene Clark Hines, Darlene Clark Hines says that the Black Women's Club movement, the National Association of Colored Women, is literally the first civil rights organization in the history of this nation. So some people have very 20th century conceptions of the civil rights movement without understanding that that period, 1954 to 1965, that was a modern mid 20th century expression of the civil rights movement. But the civil rights movement has been going on since 1619, August 1619. We've been fighting for freedom. You can see here, here's the motto of the Black Women's Club movement, lifting as we climb. Imagine if more of us embrace that today, lifting <laughs> as we climb, right? Very, very powerful to understand the motto of the movement. Here's one of their banners from the Smithsonian, lifting as we climb. In terms of major figures, someone from right, up, from right here in Massachusetts, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. It was Mrs. Ruffin's house that Du Bois went to, he says in his autobiography, every Thursday night he had dinner there when he was up in Harvard. And he said that he borrowed many books from her library. He did admit many of which he did not return. He felt bad about that. This is in the autobiography. I'm not gossiping. I'm just telling if you read carefully, OK? And so it was Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin who becomes the president of the National Association of Colored Women. This is going to be very, very important so that you can see the link right, between Du Bois and this particular organization. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Um, could be characterized as a black feminist abolitionist. And in fact, right alongside Frederick Douglass would be Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. Again, more, most people know about Douglass, and they know so little about Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. And in fact, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper was one of the greatest poets America has ever produced. And she also wrote five novels. They call her the Toni Morrison of the 19th century. This is that connection between black politics and black art. Du Bois is going to really embrace that. Again, from right here in Massachusetts, Mary Church Terrell. In fact, she goes on to found the Boston chapter of the NAACP. And Ida B. Wells, the greatest anti-lynching crusader that this country has produced. Both were pre uh, presidents, uh, if you will, of the National Association of Colored Women. And one of the most iconic members to emerge from this association, Dr. Anna Julia Cooper, who lived to be 105 years old. She was educated at Oberlin, Columbia University, and the University of Paris. She published A Voice from the South in 1892, which provided the conceptual framework for black feminism and African American women's studies. She was a leader and member of the National Association of Colored Women, and she went on to be a university president. She was the fourth African-American woman to earn her PhD. Here's a photo of members of the National Association of Colored Women. You can see that they were suffragettes as well. But some of you all know that, unfortunately, in the suffrage movement, there was a color line, right? Ida B. Wells uh, writes of this very eloquently in her autobiography, how she wanted to join with the uh, national if you will, women's clubs, but they drew the color line. And so that's why if somebody, anybody's asking why there's a special uh, black women's club movement, it's because of racial segregation and the pernicious effects of American, uh, of American apartheid. Here again, this national association, here's some further images. Before we um, transition here, I just want you to know that even in naming the organization that Du Bois co-founds, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Du Bois is troping on this parent organization. He considered them his surrogate mothers. The, these were the women who took up collections to make sure he got through all of those schools, right? So from the age of 16 to the age of 27, Du Bois was in school. That's 11 years. They supported him all the way through. And his tribute, however mute, his tribute to them is actually in the name of the NAACP. But since most people actually, they write off and erase black women and their contributions, they don't realize that. That wow, Du Bois was very, very influenced by this organization. So to understand Du Bois, we need to understand the National Association of Colored Women. We also need to understand the American Negro Academy 
And I want you to see this as the genesis of African American studies. And so if you look at other major scholarly and professional organizations, as they were coming into being in the United States of America, I just want to roll call real quick. So they found uh, the American Historical Association, 1884. American Economic Association, 1885. American Psychological Association, 1892. And look, the National Association of Colored Women, 1896. The American Negro Academy, 1897. The American Philosophical Association, 1900. The American Anthropological Association, 1902. The American Political Science Association, 1903. And lastly, the American Sociological Association, 1905. So look at how African American studies is actually quite contemporary to the formation of a lot of these other fields. So far from being new, it's actually quite old. Now we're talking about Du Bois as an intellectual ancestor. We're talking about intellectual architecture, something on which we are building thought and praxis, right? Because Du Bois always emphasized connections between theory and praxis. Some of the key members of the American Negro Academy, Anna Julia Cooper, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Elaine Locke, and certainly Du Bois. It's important to look at these figures, these iconic figures, and what they did. Anna Julia Cooper helped to initiate black feminism and African American women's studies. She wrote, obviously, uh, A Voice from the South and was a member of the National Association of Colored Women. Carter G. Woodson established the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915, as well as Negro History Week, which became, 50 years later, Black History Month. Elaine Locke um, achieved his PhD from Harvard University uh, in philosophy, and he served as the impresario of the Harlem Renaissance, one of the main ringleaders, if you will, of the Harlem Renaissance. And again, my argument here is to understand Du Bois, we need to understand these fundamental organizations. Why? Because Du Bois was about social movements. Du Bois was about political movements. Du Bois was about cultural and artistic movements. So I want you to see this emphasis on movements, right, on movements. Now, let's get right into it. W.B. Du Bois, he was born February 23rd, 1868. That's five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. He was educated at Fisk, Harvard, and the University of Berlin. Du Bois, again, being interdisciplinary, he studied philosophy, history, politics, and economics, among others. He's the first African-American to graduate from Harvard University. These are some of the things that we know. These are some of the sound bites. We all know that in here, certainly at UMass. Hallelujah. <laughs> du Bois had an 80-year publishing career from 1883 to 1963. That is phenomenal by any record. An 80-year publishing career. Let me say it slowly, because I feel so good. Du Bois started publishing at 15 and he was still publishing at 95. When it, I, I just feel so shameful. You know, people say, well, how do you do? How do you do all that? I just, it's shameful. I just feel like we, I just feel lazy, you know? <laughs> the guy didn't have a computer, didn't have an iPhone. <laughs> and in fact, if I'm gonna keep it real, they wouldn't even let him in most libraries because of segregation. And he did all of that. He co-founded the NAACP. He was one of the first scholars to seriously study African Americans' retention of African culture and contributions to American history, culture, and politics. He died the day before the March on Washington, August 27th. 1963. These are, these are some of the adjectives that we could, that have been used, pardon me, to describe W.E.B. Du Bois, a pan-Africanist, an anti-colonialist, a cultural critic, a critical race theorist, a male feminist, a radical democrat, a political economist, a sociologist, and a historian. Major works by Du Bois. Again, a lot of us know them, but I want to keep, I want to move beyond the souls of black folk. Why? If we start and stop with the souls of black folk, most people don't realize Du Bois was only 35 years old. In my work, I, I talk about intellectual assassination. Essentially, they kill him off 
at 35. And he lived another 60 years. And I have spent the great bulk of my lackluster career exploring what, is he, what did he do that last 60 years of his life? Why do people start and stop with the souls of black folk? They might go to the Talented Tent, which is also 1903. He's only 35 years old. They might go to the Philadelphia Negro. But that was in the 19th century. They don't even, I mean, the guy lives until the middle of the 20th century. You know, people talk about early period Karl Marx, middle period Marx, <laughs> late period Marx. Well, I'm fixing to talk about early period Du Bois, middle period Du Bois, and late period Du Bois. He lived 95 years. He actually deserves this kind of periodization. That's what it's called for the smart people out there, a periodization. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> scholarly works, major scholarly works, The Philadelphia Negro, The Souls of Black Folk, his 1915 classic, which really is a major contribution to cultural anthropology, Dr. Bado Baptiste, The Negro, by which he meant the black or the African. My favorite book, I, I typically don't say this, especially not in front of children, but my favorite book uh, by Du Bois is called Dark Water, 1920. And you have the seeds of Afrofuturism. So if you really want to read something that is a precursor to Black Panther, <laughs> go and pick up a book called Dark Water, where Du Bois developed some of the most beautiful short stories and poetry. In fact, it's, it's a work where he mixes so many different literary styles. You really see his genius. Now, his genius is everywhere, but I think it's pronounced in Dark Water. The Gift of Black Folk, 1924. Uh, black Reconstruction. Now, I'm fixing to contradict myself. My other favorite work, <laughs> my other favorite work by Du Bois, the 1935 classic, which really helps to inaugurate something called black Marxism, according to Cedric Robinson, black reconstruction. Black folk then and now, color and democracy, and I guess my later life favorite by Du Bois, the world in Africa, this book will change your life. I mean, you've got to read beyond the souls of black folk. Du Bois was also an editor extraordinaire of some great renown. He began his career editing the Atlanta University Studies. And for almost 20 years, roughly seemingly, between, let's say, uh, 1895 and 1915, um, each year Du Bois would put out uh, the Atlanta University Studies. And so he really, really would gather some of the most uh, brilliant scholars in this country uh, and get them together on a single theme, something I hope we do in UMass, though. You know, I hope we can do that here. It would be really beautiful. What, what Du Bois would do, you all, is with the Atlanta University Studies, he would say, what is the most pressing problems confronting black folk in America? And one year it would be religion. The next year it would be education. One year it would be uh, uh, crime. Uh, uh, one year it would be health. And so each year he would gather the top minds right, who are really doing African-Americanist work, and he would put out an edited volume. Those volumes continue to stand the test of time. They are incredible. And in fact, this year's NASA National Council for Black Studies Conference will be in Atlanta. Am I right, D Dr. Shabazz? Right? And so if y'all come on down there, you can get an opportunity to see some of those works, the Atlanta University Studies, a, a, a monument to American scholarship. After that, he edited The Moon, however briefly, the Horizon, however briefly, and his most famous editorial activities were with The Crisis, right? The um, magazine, the periodical for the NAACP. Uh, from there, once they kicked him out of the NAACP, I said it, once they kicked him out of the NAACP, he edited Phylon. Phylon is a Greek word that means race. Du Bois, like his idol Frederick Douglass, also engaged in autobiography. This is a very, very important genre within African American literature. And like Douglass, Du Bois has five autobiographical works. Now, I'm not saying that they're all autobiography, because Du Bois just didn't rock like that. There were also elements of history and culture and politics and economic analysis in Du Bois's autobiographical works. But who can deny that once you get to the souls of black folks, say, for instance, a chapter called Of the Passing of the Firstborn, that's autobiographical. Anybody with me? Yeah. Right? So autobiography is strewn throughout Du Bois's corpus. Dark Water, again, autobiography. Dusk of Dawn, he actually called that an autobiography. My favorite autobiography by Du Bois is called In Battle for Peace, 1952, which was actually at one point banned uh, in this country. God bless you. Um, and then lastly, um, they put it out on his 100th birthday, 
And Martin Luther King Jr. was the keynote speaker at his 100th birthday, February 23rd, uh, 1968, where they unveiled, uh, Dr. Herbert Aftika unveiled the autobiography of W.B. Du Bois, um, his most profound autobiography. It's amazing that he planned for his own centennial. The guy is just a genius. This is amazing to me. <laughs> it was, wow. Okay. I talked earlier about the connection between politics and arts. Most people don't realize Du Bois's creative, creative writings include five novels, several volumes of poetry, three dozen short stories, and two dozen plays. This is important so that when I start talking about interdisciplinarity, people can see Du Bois drew just as much from the arts and the humanities as he did from the social sciences. And in fact, this field called African American Studies, we actually don't make those kinds of distinctions. We find them to be very arbitrary and artificial, okay? Because African American studies is a human science. We're talking about humanity, and it's important to emphasize that. Why? Because people of African descent for so long in this country were dehumanized. Again, this emphasis on movements. Du Bois was very active in a number of social and political movements, Pan-Africanism, the African independence movement, cooperative economics movement, the Niagara movement, obviously the NAACP, the New Negro movement, the Harlem Renaissance, the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, at least the suffragette movement, that end of it, uh, the anti-war and the peace movement. So look at Du Bois, again, em embracing this whole idea of a scholar activist, of a scholar activist. It's not enough to be an academic. We have too many academics running around these campuses. What we need are intellectuals. Why? Because the intellectual's work isn't just quarantined to the college campus. An intellectual can go and rock the best of the synagogues, the mosques, the churches, the spiritual centers. They can go to town halls. They can go anywhere it's at, you can get it. Wherever they go, you can get it. That's the way Du Bois was, right? So he wasn't an academic. He was an intellectual. And if you look at what was happening when Du Bois was really emerging and coming of age as an intellectual, there was a lot of discourse on what it meant to be an American intellectual. What kind of issues would really distinguish an intellectual in America? Du Bois was at the forefront of those discussions. And we couldn't talk about Du Bois without talking about his great debate with Booker T. Washington. Some people position it as Washington emphasizing industrial education, where Du Bois emphasized liberal arts education. It wasn't that simple. Things are a lot more complicated if we actually read Right? Here, in fact, it's important to point out that Booker T. Washington actually was an advocate of self-reliance and social uplift. He secretly, most people don't know this, he secretly supported and sought civil rights and social justice. A lot of this comes from Lewis Harlan's work on Booker T. Washington, some of the best work. And I, I think uh, Washington's uh, major biographer, Lewis Harlan, has two volumes on Booker T. Washington where a lot of this comes from. Booker T. Washington proposed African Americans obtain power by accumulating wealth. That's gonna be very tricky in American society at that particular time. Washington is most famous for his September the 12th, 1895 Atlanta Compromise Address. He seemed to accept many racial myths and stereotypes about African Americans. He privileged black manual labor over black mental labor and he was at least publicly, an advocate of accommodationism. He mastered the nuances of the political arena in the late 19th century, which enabled him to manipulate the media, raise money, strategize, network, pressure and reward friends, and distribute funds while punishing those who opposed his plans for uplifting black folk. And one of the responses Du Bois came with was the talented tenth theory, but also uh, he has a key piece in his most famous book, The Souls of Black Folk, called Of Mr. Booker T. Washington and Others. Now, one of the ways that we can um, grapple and engage with The Souls of Black Folk is to look at the first three chapters. Basically, they hinge on the historical strivings of black folk. So notice Du Bois's emphasis on history. Chapters four through nine symbolize the social and political strivings of black folk. And chapters 10 through 14 represent the spiritual and religious strivings of the souls of black folk. So look at how there's a triad here, right, of the way these, cha uh, these chapters can be coupled together to understand 
the souls of black folk. At least this is the way I try to introduce it to high schoolers among other youth. There are five fundamental themes, um, I believe, in the souls of black folk. Again, some of you all may find others. These five fundamental themes, the vision of the veil. So the veil, life lived along the color line. So the color line, the concept of double consciousness, the saga of second sight, something that we saw in the recent Black Panther uh, movie, second sight, and the gift theory, another one. Of the, I could do a Souls of Black Folk read of Black Panther right now. Wow. <laughs> I'm not going to ruin the movie for you. Anyway, so these five fundamental concepts I think are very important in terms of engaging the souls of black folk. Now, let's shift to some of the academic disciplines that Du Bois directly contributed to and made significant innovations in. So let's look at the discipline of history. Du Bois really makes significant contributions to the history of race. We all know that his dissertation was called the, the suppression of the African slave trade. So he had to really grapple with a great deal of African history. Du Bois certainly mastered American history, African American history, made contributions to women's history, intellectual history, cultural history, social history, political history, economic history, and religious history. I want to emphasize this, this whole notion of economic history here because when he studied at the University of Berlin, he studied in the Department of Political Economy. There was no such thing as sociology when Du Bois was in school. So he helped to pioneer this discipline called sociology. And major subfields within sociology that Du Bois contributes to would be, first and foremost, historical sociology, political sociology, urban and rural sociology. There is no way to read the Philadelphia Negro without grappling with Du Bois's juxtaposition of urban and rural sociology. And in fact, I submit to you, before he wrote the Philadelphia Negro, Du Bois did six um, Department of Labor studies on rural, right, the rural conditions of black folk, particularly in Farmsville, Virginia. Right, some of the most incredible work. We need to republish those pieces, but they're really, really incre uh, incredible pieces. So again, both urban and rural sociology. Sociology of culture, obviously sociology of race, sociology of gender, sociology of class, sociology of education, sociology of religion, and sociology of crime. Du Bois made some serious contributions to criminology. Another major field Du Bois contributed to, education. And these are some of his major works within the area of education. So again, Du Bois as an interdisciplinarian, and notice that last point there at the bottom, the last bullet point, he published over 100 articles on education. So that shows you Du Bois is emphasize, emphasizes this whole notion of education is connected to transformation. And I like to say education for social transformation, education for human liberation, and in fact, Du Bois is preoccupied with education because in the United States of America for 350 years, it was prohibited for African Americans to be educated. That was not lost on Du Bois. That was not lost on Du Bois. 350 years to hold people in bondage and tell them they can't get married, they can't be educated. Du Bois did not forget that, right? We go from there, education to religion. Most people don't talk about this. This is a little taboo when it comes to Du Bois. Arguably, the first sociologist of American and African American religion. And these are some of the works where you can see some of his sociology of religion really, really comes through, particularly his 1903. If you all uh, have not read it, in the same year that Du Bois published The Souls of Black Folk, he published a work called The Negro Church, which is a profound, profound, profound work. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide. Also on religion, it keeps going here. The University of Massachusetts Press in 1980 put out a book called Prayers for Dark People. And these are prayers that Du Bois wrote, composed himself. They are incredible. They are absolutely incredible. And so please note, Du Bois contributed not simply to sociology of religion, but also to history of religion philosophy of religion, anthropology of religion, psychology of religion, religious economy, and political theology, among others. And I argue that his work in religion prefigures black Christian nationalism, black liberation theology, and even elements of womanist theology. 
I want to transition here from the traditional fields and disciplines to some of the other areas that Du Bois contributes to. Du Bois was a pioneer Pan-Africanist. We don't have to break up and talk about whether Du Bois invented Pan-African. That's all beside the point. It is, it is undisputable that Du Bois helped to popularize Pan-Africanism. That's what's going to be really important, right? This is very, very key. And look, as early as 1900, Du Bois attends the Pan-African Conference. There, right along with him, was Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper. Again, that influence of the National Association of Colored Women, right? Who were also Pan-Africanists. Most people don't. There's a book. We should write that book. There's a book. Wow, the Pan-Africanism of the National Association of Colored Women. This is profound, right? So you can see a lot of his Pan-Africanist activities there. So Du Bois's Pan-Africanism, but also, I should say it outright, his anti-colonialism. Look at his doctoral dissertation. It is called The Suppression of the African Slave Trade. If that's not anti-colonialism, nothing is. And so please note all the way throughout until the last year of his life when he came out with Colonial and Colored Unity, which is a pamphlet in 1963, this is going to be one of the major, major preoccupations of Du Bois' life. From here, we go directly to Du Bois as an architect of African American studies. And in fact, I argue that he is a major architect of African American studies. We've already talked about him being an interdisciplinarian, that this is fundamental to the field. The field should be intersectionalist. That means it should not just be black male studies. You know, that's the way some people do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I ain't mad. I'm in women and gender and sexuality studies out in Boulder, because, you know, that's where all the freaky people live. <laughs> so we can mix it up where I'm at. I'm not afraid to say it. But some of y'all know for a long time when people said black studies, they really meant black male studies. And women were often intellectually erased and rendered invisible. So it's important to take up Kimberly Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality, right? Which is very, very powerful, which I believe has been fundamental to the best of African American studies. The best of the field is always going to emphasize, right? The full range, the full gender spectrum, if you will. Right? Du Bois was a multi-methodologist. In fact, he came up with something called methodological triangulation. That's a $5 word. Methodological triangulation. Mm. Du Bois was also a scholar activist, but a scholar artist. A lot of his novels feature female protagonists. Right? They're deeply black feminists. And so he would mix his, his activism with his artistry, his poetics with his politics. And ultimately, Du Bois is also a radical humanist. Within African American studies, there are 10 fundamental fields that Du Bois drew from consistently. And these are those fields there, uh, history, religion, philosophy, politics, economics, sociology, psychology, anthropology, education, and the arts, aesthetics. So again, I'm trying to get you to understand then that when we say African American studies, we're talking about an interdisciplinary discipline. I'm putting it very poorly, but Right? So it's, in fact, I, I say in some of my other work, it's transdisciplinary. That means it transgresses and transcends the artificial and arbitrary boundaries of disciplines. And in fact, Du Bois breaks down barriers and breaks down borders. So he's a border crosser, if you will, conceptually speaking. In my work, I argue that Du Bois not only helped to found black studies, but he was also instrumental to founding what's called white studies. And in and in fact, critical white studies. These are some of his major works in terms, major contributions to critical white studies. And some of y'all have already realized if I'm teaching in Boulder, Colorado, I have to do a lot of critical white studies, even as I do, <laughs> even as I do, <laughs> watch out, even as I do uh, black studies. Boy, this is it here. Yeah. Mm. We're doing it. I want y'all to please notice that, uh, look at the second bullet point. Most people don't realize this. W.B. Du Bois wrote the first biography of John Brown in 1909, the same year that he co-founded the NAACP. John Brown, the great European-American abolitionist who was willing to the really, really, I mean, he brought fury. He brought fury to it. Very, very close, John Brown was, with Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And so Du Bois wanted to write the, um, the uh, biography of Frederick Douglass, uh, but Booker T. Washington took that one. He took John Brown. So it's very profound here to see this. Also, in 1910, one of my favorite works by Du Bois is called The Souls of White Folk. Most people know The Souls of Black Folk, 
but they don't know Du Bois's piece, The Souls of White Folk. This will change your life, I'm telling you. This will change your life. This is also, again, why I say if you start and stop with The Souls of Black Folk, you don't really know Du Bois. You know a piece of Du Bois, but you don't really know the full range of someone that lived and worked 95 years, right? Please notice the last bullet point there. Published over 100 articles uh, in areas such as philosophy of race, sociology of race, critical race theory, whiteness, critical white studies, and anti-black racism. So again, this is going to be a really, really key area that often gets overlooked. In fact, Du Bois, being dialectical in his thought, would say something like, you can't really understand black folk unless you understand white folk, right? And I also believe that Du Bois would be very open to us moving beyond the so-called black-white binary and, expect, uh, and engaging everybody in between as well. And in fact, his work does engage lots of folk in between. If you think I'm tripping, go and pick up a book called Du Bois on Asia, edited by Bill Mullen. There's a whole book. Du Bois wrote so much on Asia. There's a whole book out called Du Bois on Asia. Right, really, really fascinating here. So Du Bois isn't just for so-called black studies. Du Bois isn't just for African American studies. He, again, is a world historical figure. I don't need to tell anybody at UMass that. We move on from black and white studies to Du Bois's major contribution to women, gender, uh, women and gender studies. These are some of his major works. My favorite uh, of this bunch would be The Black Mother, 1912. Suffering Suffragettes, 1912, Votes for Women, 1912. Do y'all see a theme? Du Bois was one of the most vocal male suffragettes, if you will, in the United States of America. He was one of the most vocal men right, for women achieving the right to vote. Most people negate that. But he was completely out. I mean, out, I mean this was very unusual, if you will. And in fact, if you turn to the other great sociological thinkers, people like, let's say, Karl Marx, Emile Durkheim, Max Weber, you won't find many flattering words with respect to women. But with Du Bois, you do have strong work with respect to women. I'm not saying he's perfect, because I don't know if a man can be perfect when it comes to gender politics or in your socialized in a sexist society, but we can try, brothers. <laughs> my, my favorite piece up here is going to be called The Damnation of Women, 1920. Changed my life when I read it. That is in Dark Water. So this is one of the major chapters of Dark Water. It's called The Damnation of Women. And this is a profound piece. But also, in 1924, his piece, The Freedom of Womanhood. Du Bois published over 75 articles on women's rights, women's suffrage, and gender justice. Du Bois believed that African-American women had a special role to play, had special contributions to make. He argued that black women have and would continue to contribute to three great revolutions. The revolution against racism, the revolution against sexism, and the revolution against capitalism. Last time I checked, that would be like early 20th century intersectionality because there were still lots of taboos surrounding discussing sexuality in the early half of the 20th century, although we had some brave folk who actually did bring that out in the open. I'm not going to invoke Langston Hughes or Claude McKay or Zora Neale Hurston right now. I could roll call a lot of Harlem Renaissance figures who they were grappling with sexuality right there. Right? So their work was already intersectional if people actually look at it from a framework that's specific to the Harlem Renaissance as opposed to always trying to superimpose some kind of um, lost generation paradigm onto the Harlem Renaissance. Okay? So I think it's important to, to, to grapple with both Right? And both are sort of grappling with sexuality in some really unique ways for early 20th century America. We're heading home, y'all, because I want to dialogue with you all about Du Bois, you mass. So lastly, Du Bois and his work in political economy. Cedric Robinson argues that Du Bois inaugurates something called black Marxism. We all know that Du Bois joined the Socialist Party in 1911, and he summarily resigned from the Socialist Party in 1912 because, and I quote, they discriminate against Negroes and Asiatics. Du Bois quit the Socialist Party. Look at this level of intellectual independence. So on principle, he believes in certain aspects of socialism. Now, most people in Trump's America don't know what socialism is. But I would like to think, since Bernie Sanders came from somewhere up here in New England, some of y'all know what socialism is. 
And by the very fact that Du Bois puts democratic in front of it, you can see what mm, Du Bois is doing. And I'm well aware that many people mm, seek to colonize socialism because isn't that precisely what Adolf Hitler said he was doing in Nazi Germany? He too called it socialism. I don't need to bring up Joseph Stalin who said that what he was doing as well, but I'll leave that alone. Du Bois don't want nothing to do with that. Again, it's not a perfect socialism because I don't know anybody that has a perfect socialism. Mm. But as early as 1907, Du Bois is moving in this direction. 1907, y'all, that's only four years after he publishes The Souls of Black Folk. Again, for all those people that go around telling me how elitist Du Bois was, and he was so aristocratic, you don't know Du Bois. How could the same person write Black Reconstruction? They haven't read Du Bois. They haven't gone to the Du Bois papers at UMass. <laughs> oh, I should be like y'all. I should do commercials for y'all, shouldn't I? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Anyway, the socialists of the past, 1907. The Negro and Socialism, 1907. The Economic Aspects of, of Race Prejudice, 1910. Socialism is too narrow for Negroes. So look at Du Bois as a critic of socialism. He didn't just accept it as people hand it down. He developed his own independent interpretation of socialism. And in fact, I would argue with everybody in here, develop your own relationship with Du Bois. That's what this is about. Obviously, I have my own funky, freaky relationship with Du Bois. You got to do some work and develop your own working relationship with Du Bois. And he has something for everybody. I feel like I'm about to preach and say, come on now, come on. Come on up here if you want to get saved, sinners. Woo! Mm, feel so good today. Feel so good. Feel so good. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to move on. Black Marxism and democratic socialism. So look at how once we get to the so-called Great Depression, because, I mean, if you're black in America, you've always been depressed economically speaking. Okay. You've never not been economically depressed, and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Talking about a Great Depression. We've been Great Depressed since the Middle Passage. <laughs> Whew. I feel the spirit of Du Bois. I really do sometimes. Oh, I'm trying to be not, I don't want to embarrass you, Whitney, but I feel so good right now. Oh, I do, I do, I do. Woo. Okay. That's okay, thank you, thank you. All right. So, Du Bois has the Negro and radical thought, the Negro and communism. Look at Karl Marx and the Negro. Mm. Marxism and the Negro problem, black reconstruction, lifting from the bottom. Ooh, wait, am I saying that Du Bois was subaltern in 1937? If subaltern is about looking at things from the bottom, Du Bois, was, black reconstruction was subaltern. I better stop it. Okay. Ooh. One of my favorite works by Du Bois is his 1953 classic, Negroes and the Crisis of Capitalism in the United States. You've got to read this. Look at that bottom, uh, that bottom bullet point. Numerous, he published numerous articles on black radical politics, economics, and democratic socialism. And from your archive, from the Du Bois papers, from your collection, here is Du Bois with Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of Russia. I'm just saying, for all the people who think I'm tripping and Du Bois is not a world historical figure, the Russians know something we don't. You may ask. Here is Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois with Nikita Khrushchev in Russia. Here is Du Bois and Mao Zedong. This is from your collection. I'm just showcasing your collection. Why I've been coming out here for 25 years. <laughs> Woo. Here is Du Bois, the world historical figure, having a good laugh with Mao Zedong. Can you all see? Can you all hear me? Can you all see? Du Bois, like Michael Jackson, had a bit of LIGO. Most people didn't understand why Michael Jackson put on the glove. We don't talk about it openly, but a lot of African Americans believe that a bit of LIGO is contagious. So they won't shake your hand. So when people keep saying how elitist Du Bois is because he shook people's hands with gloves, he actually did it for them and not for him. He knew it wasn't contagious, right? And so again, you can see in a lot of these photographs, it started early on, right? But he wore gloves often. This is interesting, right? You didn't know I could make a Michael Jackson and Du Bois connection. It's dope, baby. Hip hop, we don't stop. Okay. Here's Du Bois and Mao again. Look at his stature. Du Bois is a very small man like myself. You know, that's why I looked up. He was left handed. I'm left handed. I thought, okay. 
He just had his mama. I just had my mama. Wow. Look at him. What mouth say, Tom? Here's Du Bois with the great Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, the great Kwame Nkrumah. This is Du Bois and Shirley Graham Du Bois in Ghana. This is Du Bois, I believe, on his 95th birthday with Shirley Graham Du Bois and Mr. and Mrs. Nkrumah. And as we close out, this is one of my favorite photos of Du Bois. I have so many of them that I've gotten from the collection. Thank you very much for digitizing it. And this is one of my favorites because it shows Du Bois at his home. And if you look, Frederick Douglass is looking over his shoulder. And he has his only son, his photo there on the mantle, Burkhardt. It's a very powerful photo. Du Bois idolized Douglas. A lot of people like to talk about Du Bois as a Marxist or this or that or the other. Again, if you don't grapple with the influence of, let's say, a Harriet Tubman and a Frederick Douglass, the National Association of Colored Women, or the American Negro Academy, we won't really understand the intellectual architecture of a figure like Du Bois and how he built on that and took it world historical all around the world. And so I will close with Du Bois's last message to the world, which he composed in 1957 where he says, I have loved my work, I have loved people and my play, but always I have been uplifted by the thought that what I have done well will live long and justify my life, that what I have done ill or never finished can now be handed on to others for endless days to be finished, perhaps better than I could have done. I hope that we continue what he started. Thank you. Thank you. I know, um, I don't, I, let's open it up for questions and answers, uh, question time. If you would just raise your hand and, and, and speak loudly, uh, that would be great. So do we have any questions for Dr. Rabaka? There's one more round of applause that we don't have to stand, but thank you. <laughs> I said he would bring the fire. Not all of y'all are used to the fire. It's okay. This is the age of Wakanda, so get used to it. We are, we are here to stay, and we are here in all of our Wakandaness and our blackness and our. And that doesn't mean it's exclusion of anybody else. Join in. I'm telling you, it is a good place to be. Okay, go see Black Panther. Clearly, that's the message for today. <laughs> and read several of the favorite works of Dr. Rebecca, as he said, because each one of them will change your life. Yes, Markeisha. Hello. Um, I just want to say thank you for being here and I'm a follower of your work, actually. And my students actually love this book very much. Oh. <laughs> very kind. <laughs> no, thank you very much. much. Of all the books that I inside, this is the one that they keep. Oh. And the one they keep returning to, the one they keep asking. So thank you for that. Hip hop's inheritance. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you a very new boy specific question. Um, as I've read much of his work, I'm a product of this environment and I studied in the new boys program um, over at the African House. And I wanted to know how pivotal do you think uh, his going to Fisk instead of Harvard for undergraduate was in his own transformation? This is, a, this is an, an incredible question, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, and I thank you for it. Um, and some of his work, he talks specifically about being incredibly disappointed that he could not initially go to Harvard. And, and so the townsfolk, as you know the story, sent him to Fisk, because it was a good Negro school. Uh, it, it's a very good school, by the way. I mean, Fisk produced David Levering Lewis, who I think will be with on Friday. I mean, 
Fisk. Um, du Bois, tongue in cheek, said that when he got to Fisk, the first time he went to the cafeteria, he said that he thought he had died and gone to heaven because Lena Horne's grandmother was, or was, it, yeah, was on one side of him, and I forget, was it Margaret Murray? Why is Margaret Murray at that time was on the other side of him, and so he had you know, not been around a lot of you know, beautiful sisters. So that, so that was one thing. I think the, the grounding in Southern culture, um, I think coming from New England and what that must have done to him. You know, he talks a lot about the frenzy um, uh, experiencing African American religion, um, the rootedness and the connecting to the agriculture as well, um, folk tales, among other things, just different, you know, the ways, if you will, of black folk in the South. You can tell I'm from the South. Um, and so, yeah, that groundedness, I just think, gave him a, just a different worldview, right? So he synthesizes that with the, the, some of the elements of the New England worldview, and you have a very unique figure, right? So a lot of African Americans at this time, as you know, are going from the South to the Northeast. Du Bois, being Du Bois, doing it like only Du Bois can do it, goes from the Northeast to the South. Check this out. Du Bois is also that figure who, let's be honest, some people would consider quite conservative when he's young, and he becomes increasingly more radical as he gets older. So he flips that old adage on its head where you're sort of young and radical, and then you're old and conservative. Du Bois, he did everything sort of his way. It's really, really unique. So I think that that, that grounding, if you will, in Southern history and Southern culture, also in Southern struggle, because there were different ways that black folk in the South were resisting segregation than you know, then presented itself in New England. Du Bois soaked all of that up. I hope I answered your question. I'm just starting to learn about Du Bois, so bear with me. Uh -huh. um, I had a question about the friendship with Mao, but well, I didn't know he had a friendship with Mao until he showed it to us. Okay. And I, I have read um, his pretty flattering obituary of Stalin. Okay. And my question is this. I understand the appeal of Marxism to him completely. Um, did he know, and did Americans generally know about the labor camps, the famines, the executions? Or did, did he not know, or did he want to just honor the shared spirit in some respects and um, not, you know, not try to the baby with the bathwater? What was his level of information and his response to that? Okay, thank you. This is a great question. This is one that comes up a lot. Um, with respect to Du Bois, I would say to you that obviously this is pre-iPhones, internet, and all that kind of stuff. And you and I both know the media back then, there's a lot of filtering that's going on, especially during M McCarthyism, which actually affects Du Bois directly, okay? They actually throw him in jail, as you might know, handcuff and put him in jail, 82 years of age. Um, really sad. Um, and so I think that Du Bois was preoccupied with the idea of a democratic socialist society. And a lot of times, from my understanding, from what the scholars have, have, have written, a lot of times when he traveled to certain countries, he was chaperoned around a great deal. So he's not gonna be privy and he's not gonna know, um, you know, Du Bois had a love affair with Germany. I mean, he has a you know, degree from the University of Berlin, but to act like he somehow knew um, stuff that you know, he obviously did not know, I mean, and some of the countries he's traveling in, he would be one of the few African Americans, so everybody knows exactly who's going where, when, and all of that, that kind of stuff. So Du Bois is preoccupied um, with a lot of the ideas there, and the actually putting them into practice, which is going to be something that's always going to be tricky, right? I'm thinking about also the work of Robin D.G. Kelly. He has a book called Freedom Dreams, Freedom Dreams uh, by Robin D.G. Kelly. And in that book, Robin D.G. Kelly says, We shouldn't be so preoccupied with whether movements achieve each and every one of their goals. Really, what's important about movements is does it inspire the next generation to continue the struggle? And I think that Du Bois is one of those figures who, when he looks at certain things that were going on around the world, he's grasping for certain things and synthesizing them with certain things and talking about different examples of, of different things. Okay? Great question, though. Thank you for the question. Okay, we're going to take a couple more questions because we have this amazing 
um, reception downstairs with real food. Um, and I know you can smell it, yes? Okay. Um, so please, a couple more questions and don't, don't go to the, to the food yet. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. That was a fantastic overview. Uh, one thing that I hoped you could talk about um, more specifically was uh, Du Bois' relationship with organized labor and the way that that evolved over time, not just uh, in the U.S., but also internationally. Okay. Great question. Um, again, Du Bois did have a very, very interesting relationship with organized labor. Obviously, he, with his work in political economy, this is going to be something that's very, very important. And you can see during the Harlem Renaissance period, there were a lot of figures, certainly um, A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owens, right? Um, so they're going to be doing a lot of really incredible work. And Du Bois evolves his relationship by talking more and more about workers banding together. He also put a special emphasis, though, on white workers dropping the, the color line because there were more of them and they, had, they were in more of a privileged position. So he thought that that they were in a privileged p p position to break down some of these barriers and that that was really important. He also talked about um, uh, black, black workers being very skilled, prompt, professional, all those kinds of things, but also c expanding and creating more opportunities, right? So he saw the labor struggle as a major struggle. This is also why Du Bois is going to turn in the direction of what someone like Paul Boole is going to call American Marxism. Right? This is where you also can put Du Bois into dialogue with a figure like C.L.R. James, who's also going to be writing in this country, um, with his colleague and good friend Grace Lee Boggs, and my own personal favorite, Raya Donayevskaya. So a lot of that activity is happening around the Midwest, particularly in D Detroit. But you have lots of different folks sort of banding together, getting involved in labor struggles. And I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of Du Bois's uh, run for the Senate. Um, so when he ran, he, he was ran as an independent, but he had lots of support from different labor unions, right? Because they believed that Du Bois was really on the side of workers, if you will. And so this is really interesting to sort of think about the Harlem Renaissance as being grounded in folk culture. And I'm saying that with all due respect. In fact, I understand hip hop to be a folk culture, right? I think now we use terms like popular culture, but it's, you know, in the academy, it's a folk culture. And in that sense, workers' culture it's always going to sort of be folk culture, and workers' culture is always going to be bound up in popular culture, which is why you and I both probably know that lots of elements of hip hop are very much sort of workers' culture. These are sort of working class folk. This is their worldview, their value system, and so on and so forth, which is why it gets really tricky with a lot of the bourgeois elements that sometimes come out in a lot of rap music. I know, I, I digress. But yeah, but definitely Du Bois has really strong connects, if you will, with working class struggles and different labor unions. He did have problems, though, with a lot of the racism sometimes of different organized labor unions, though. One last question, and then we can, uh, two quick questions, and then that's it. OK. Yes. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And uh, my question is, uh, you talked a lot about how uh, Du Bois wrote about black Marxism and democratic socialism. And I was wondering um, if you knew anything about uh, his relationship to politics and reparations, specifically for African Americans, and within the pan African politics. <laughs> This is really good. Um, in my book, Du Bois's Dialectics, I actually developed a, uh, a piece called um, Critical Theory of Reparations. And so it's based on Du Bois's proposal to the United Nations for reparations for African Americans. And I actually placed Du Bois into dialogue with not only Malcolm X, who did something similar, but the Republic of New Africa. And so it's really important to understand, I think over a long period of time, a lot of what we call Du Bois's Pan-Africanism a lot of times, and his black radicalism, if you will, was very grounded in a push for reparations, right? Now, for Du Bois, he's not necessarily interested in always in money. It wasn't like a monetary thing. In fact, that might be the last thing Du Bois would argue for, as I say in this chapter. Um, du Bois is interested in housing, health care, education, right, food, like basic stuff that African Americans did not receive from the United States government for 350 years, Du Bois began to talk about, well, how is it that we're supposed to experience the Emancipation Proclamation and those of us from Texas, June 19th, Juneteenth, right? So it's uh, January, uh, June 19th, 1865, and there's no, there's little or no, nothing, right? Nothing 
very little done to actually help people get up. And so Du Bois really pushed for um, measures, uh, if you will, to really try to sort of right some of these wrongs and at least give us a level playing field. And so a lot of that work I do um, in my critical reparations theory chapter, though. But that's a great question. Um, okay, so he asked if I could talk about uh, Du Bois and Dr. Herbert Aptiker. Um, Dr. Aptiker was, as you know, Du Bois's literary executor. So when he left the United States of America in 1961 um, to go to Ghana, uh, he left uh, Professor Aptiker in charge with his papers, which are now here uh, at, at, at UMass. But uh, Professor Aptiker is a very unique figure, uh, if you will, um, amongst um, historians, and certainly African-American historians. Um, his training at Columbia, as you know, but his gravitation towards African-American historiography you know, as a field, and particularly elements of radicalism. So if you, his, his wonderful work, um, uh, Negro Slave Revolts, where he documents 350, uh, if you will, revolts of enslaved Africans, um, is going to be very important. He goes on to just have several series of work um, that were really sort of incredible, um, bringing little known episodes in African American history and culture to light. He's going to be unique as well because of the influence um, of Marxist and leftist politics and radical, if you will, historiography. And he, uh, Aptiker, um, believes that this marginalization of African Americans, if not in other progressive groups in America, meant that to really do American history one has to almost do it from what we call now, from a subaltern perspective. You really have to look from below and not from above. So um, like Du Bois, he believed that there were so many people that were writing from above that we really did need people that could write from below the sides, right, different angles and different things like that. So it's very, very important. But it's also, Aptheker is a very unique figure in that he's very open, vocal, adamant about the influence of African American historiography on his craft, on his body of work, on what he was able to, to do. And um, uh, yeah, just a really special re relationship that went on over a long period of time. I ended up with the collection of the published writings of Du Bois um, by Herbert Aptiker. I have them in my house. Um, and everything that he's put out, obviously, on Du Bois, even the literary legacy of Du Bois, his 1989 book, um, which is very, very good. Um, so he's a very, very powerful think uh, thinker, and I think that, again, he is considered arguably, you know, it, this is, he's one of the definitive Du Bois scholars, like the greatest, one, one of the, the greatest, if you will. Thank you so much. I hope to see you downstairs. <laughs>